Prairie Park Board meeting, September 12th. Roll call. Bartelt. Here. Davis. Here. Dearth. Here. Budak. Here. Martin. Metz. Here. Millette. Here. Palmieri. Quali. Here. Franz. Here. Thank you. All right. The August 8th minutes. Any comments, questions, concerns, feedback? Make a motion to approve. Second. We have a second. All in favor of approving the August 8th minutes as written? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. All right, it doesn't look like we have any citizen statements. Any old business? Oh, all right. New business. Review conceptual design for the Menominee Park Beach House Boathouse renovation. Bath house. Bathhouse. Bath. Oof. <laughs> Ooh, I want to be jobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to start it out tonight by saying you're going to hear a lot of projects delayed for certain reasons, and hopefully all of you know. It's pretty standard for just about anything in the industry, whether it's staffing, material, stuff like that. But So this is one project that has been slow to get back to you because of um, the architect that we're working with locally has some other larger projects that... He was being asked to move forward, so it's been a little delayed, but we're here showing you at least right now the, the conceptual design. What I wanted to start first with reminding you and letting the citizens see, this is a um, picture of a bathhouse from roughly 1920. Um, we did share this with the Parks Board when we originally started talking about what should we do to move forward? Do we want to try to retain some of the existing building? Do we start over? And if you recall, the, the Parks Bay Parks Board gave direction that we'd like to try to retain as much as possible, try to get additional brick to match um, what is there. And then you can also hopefully remember we talked about an addition going to the south um, to help accommodate some of the equipment for the Otter Street Fishing Club. Um, we talked about doing that because they really provide winter recreation. They keep the roads open, they put the bridges out, whether it's for ice fishing, um, snowshoeing, ATVing, whatever it might be on the, the ice. Um, by having their equipment here, um, it is more convenient. And again, it provides winter um, recreation for citizens and, and visitors alike. So um, in the conceptual drawing, you're gonna see we tried to get back to having this, the cupola on top, getting some more windows. Uh, I'll get into the design a little bit. So kind of walk you through as you're coming from um, the end of Merritt Street, what we wanted to do was uh, provide some shade. Um, please don't get stuck on the colors of the shade. We just wanted to give you some kind of an idea of what we um, thought could really be a nice addition for the, the area along with some benches or picnic tables. Um, we do have some, showing some bollards here that we wanna make sure that are there. Um, those would most likely, we, they're removable bollards so that in the winter months they'd be gone so that Otter Street can get in and out of there as they need. Um, these, uh, Shade structures um, are able to, to be taken down and, and put back up. So it gives you kind of a feel from looking from the south. Um, this next slide gives you a little, little more feeling as we start to look from the water's edge. You can see again, we tried to try to get back to that feeling of having that, uh, the, the roof line. You're gonna see um, in another slide, you're gonna see different garage doors that we're looking at for this. Um, you'll see that in another slide, but take a look, uh, what we're proposing is some glass doors here. Um, in addition to the glass doors, we do have a roll down um, garage type door that we'd pull down, and that would primarily be down to avoid vandalism and things that'll happen down here. So, uh, but we really wanted to have an open area, a glass area so you can see out to the water. Um, so please notice that. I'll just kind of walk through. Hopefully you can see my cursor. These would be two um, gender neutral restrooms out here. Um, we did not include showers in there. We included a um, outdoor shower wash area right here, right by the drinking fountain. There is another um, gender neutral restroom inside the facility that would have a shower. So again, kind of gives you a feel with the, the windows 
on the doors and then with the roll up doors down. Um, this is where we would intend to store kayaks, canoes, stand up paddle boards, those types of things that we are renting out right now at the amusement area. You can see again the, the two restroom facilities. Um, just a little close up of you know, the garage doors down or the, the roll up doors down and then the glass. So this next slide kind of gives you an idea and kind of wants some feedback. What we, we tried to do is just not have typical garage doors here. We felt we wanted to have a little something um, facing the south. This is really the entry for the building. So um, we asked the architect come up with something other than just a, a slotted garage door. Um, the other option we wanted was a tempered glass option, which is shown down here. Um, so keep that in mind and we'll come back and have some discussion about that. couple indoor views for you just again very conceptual where the storage area would be for kayaks canoes this gets you out into the the main lobby area so from inside the main lobby again being able to see out you can see the natural lighting that would be coming in through the area we would envision going back to having some um, vending machines here this would be the staff counter for uh, the rentals taking in rentals there's a small staff office back in here. This is the, uh, the indoor restroom, which would have a shower in here. Gave us a little more uh, oversight and control over having another restroom in here. This is kind of the, the floor plan. I'll blow it up a little bit. So again, just the floor plan, uh, gender neutral restrooms to the outside, gender ne neutral restroom here. Um, this is our mechanicals and storage, water heaters, uh, electrical boxes, those types of things, staff office. This area, again, having an open area, um, we would envision potentially having uh, maybe some classes down here. It might be a good spot for some morning yoga, um, other exercise programs. Um, but also just being available um, possibly um, with the sailing group and other air, um, groups that utilize the beach area for them to, to be inside at certain times. Again, the storage area. And then this entire section, the, the end of the existing building is right here. And so this would be the addition for uh, some of the trucks, the ice bridges, the types of equipment that they need for um, maintaining the ice during the winter. And then as we go further south, this is the expanded concrete area with the shade structures. Again, just indicating some, some picnic tables and so forth. I think this is just the floor plan again. So that's what we are currently at. Um, what I'd like to do is get some initial reaction from the board. Is it something that you feel that you, when you requested to, to mimic kind of what was there back in the early 1920s, um, get into some discussion about a preference on the, the garage doors on the south side, any other things that jumped out at you? Um, we can go back and make some revisions. What we'd like to do is try to come to a uh, final conceptual design. From that phase, we can start looking at um, coming up with some cost estimates for the building and then we'll know how we're going to potentially be able to fund that. Um, we have not done some test digs in the foundation of this building yet. That would be one of our next steps. I think we're planning to do that in September, October, just to see what it looks like underground. Um, so that may or may not add to, to some of the cost or to the work of what needs to be done as well. So I will open the floor for input comments if we're on the right track. I like the uh, second garage door option, the one with the more natural light. This tempered glass one? Yeah. I just think it would, if there's events in there and whatnot, I think open or close, it would provide a lot more natural light versus. But that's just gonna be storage, that's right? Storage. Well, that's a storage. storage. I thought that was in the other room. No. no. This. Well, that's storage. This here, this we're planning to have glass, but then the roll up doors are there. They'll just be pulled down. Um, Got it. Off season, most likely. Madam Chair? Yes. 
So I get that that storage. Um, I think, and to preface it, I think the overall structure and addition is respectful of the original architecture, and I think it looks great. Um, you know, even if that is the garage part, the sight line leading you to it, I think would be, it, it would look much better with glass. Otherwise, you know, you've got this LE leading up to garage doors. So sight line wise, I think it would be a better look, even if they you know, the, the stalls are not the functional part of the building. I think it'd be But then thing. you're walking up to seeing the backs of trucks and glass type and so on yeah we yeah. the tempered glass you can make so that you could possibly Can't not see, see. correct right. okay thank you and i wouldn't think that you want to be able to see in no you wouldn't want to be able to see if it's storage yeah because then people would want to break in and see possibly yeah i think it still looks more aesthetically pleasing than that first one though yeah and these again just Examples, there's other things out there that, as you've seen in other garage door purchases, you can make for your home. So, you know, if there's something out there that we want to look at, definitely. But I kind of like the feel of the glass. I think it adds a little bit more class to the building. I think it, in my mind, it, it's a little more upscale looking that way. Matches the rest of the building a little better. Mm -hmm. Do you need a motion? Right. And those two doors on the out, those two doors right there, one's just to get into the storage, like the Otter Street, and then that other one. These two doors here? Yeah. Um, yeah, one's to the garage, one's to our, um, like our serving area. Okay. For the staff place, yes. You can see here, Becky, here's the one that goes into the Otter Street one, and then this okay. is behind the, the staff counter. Okay. So back to Kay's question, not looking for a motion in, I think it's more of getting some feedback, making sure we're on the right direction. Um, and then right now what I would do is just take back and we'll keep it in the minutes as far as what your thoughts are in the garage door, any other changes. Um, and then we can start working on some cost estimates. Um, as I said, um, Chad will be coordinating with the architect to take a look at the foundation to see what it looks like underground. We do know there's some utilities um, as we add some additional building and concrete. Um, there is some underground utilities we need to be aware of there, so we'll have to keep those in, in mind as well. How much detail are you wanting to talk about this? Like, is this, I know this is pretty conceptual still, but like, um, for example, um, like the shower by the drinking fountain struck me as kind of an odd, like, it seemed pretty close together. If I'm showering and or drink, getting a drink and somebody shy right next to me. So this was like a, like a, that struck me as you're just describing things. These two do not have showers in right here. This is the no, only one. No, the exterior one. Exterior, exterior yeah. shower. Oh, and and that's more of a rinse yeah. off than okay. anything so else. That's kind of what I was thinking. Like, or like have a foot rinse kind of a thing. Both, right. Just like yeah. up at our pool, at yeah. the pilot pool. Yeah. It's to, to rinse off. Okay. Rinse your feet off. Because um, that'll be, that'll be some new concrete here as well. So if you're rinsing the sand off, you hopefully can then walk concrete to get there so it's really not intended to be a full shower full but shower. how close is it to the bubbler so that you might get like even splatter from some yeah of splatter from lighting. the shower and well, sand then the other thing too is that we've talked about this internally that it's a concept for having a drinking mm -hmm. fountain there but in practicality it's challenging because people will use that for filling up buckets or doing something uh, doing water even though they're next to a lake They'll pour sand and stuff like that. So we got some concerns yeah. about an exterior drinking fountain in general, but trying to provide something. Okay. Where's the best location for it? Okay. Down on that side is practical because all of our utilities are down there mm -hmm. to do it for winterizing. Uh, but that's what we're trying to look into, what's the best application. We can look at that, though. I, I get what you're saying. It, it looks close here. I can't tell you what the dimensions are. Yeah. So once we get into the finer detail, if it's something where it's close to that shower, we can look at an alternative location then. Is there a drinking fountain inside? Right now. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't think there is. No, we're not showing one. So maybe by the vending machines or something? Yeah, why don't you put it inside so that it can be protected from vandalism and everything. 
Another question I had was, I like the those like sales. Do you have you? Are there any places that we've applied those? Where we have those in town? At um, South Park at the Inclusive Playground, we have something similar. Okay. And then up at the pool, we have similar type materials for some of the shade structures. Oh, okay. And that's been worked well. Oh well. Yeah. Um, there's some pretty reputable companies out there that. Yeah. I mean, the ones at the pool, I believe they're there since. 2006 when the pool opened. So. Management magazines. They're all, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we just take the canopy off that annually. Okay. So these would come season. down in the winter. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another question. You mentioned vandalism. I know it's just renderings, but like, do you have any plans for like lighting on the exterior to give um, some more visibility at night? Yeah. Yep. We'll work with um, the architect on that, mm -hmm. and then any new buildings we're putting in. If we can't connect to the city infrastructure there and get the cameras that can be um, remoted right to the police department, we're putting in a recording device so that until we can get the infrastructure there, then we can hook in. So this will have a, the video cameras recording device as well. The other thing we're looking as far as lighting is hopefully as much as non-heat generating as possible. Lake flies, bugs, the whole works with everything else down there in different areas. Mm -hmm. And along the wire, you know, this is one of those buildings we're going to add to our, our um, our pesticide applications for spiders and all that stuff too that it's a big deal around those areas so and I don't know if there's a I think because location and how it's access access is tough but having if like on the playground side of the building like having a sidewalk and maybe like just having it so people can tell what it is because that side I think would be a place where people would approach it from a lot because there's obviously people walking back and forth across the grass to the playground and back. And so I don't know what you would do with that, but I, I see that as being a, um, a front door, even though it's the back door, or however you, you know, like. So, so, sec sorry. so some type of trail connection potentially from the community mm -hmm. playground over here. And I know the rendering doesn't show the trail going through there, but it's not connected directly to the building right now. But right. The, the park trail does go through there. So it does. Be easy yep. to connect. Yeah. I think a cut through would be good. And even just so people would know what it is on the other side. Because, I mean, obviously that would be accomplished by signage. But from, I was just going past the other day, it doesn't look like I would know what it is from the playground side of mm -hmm. things. So. It's a more of a signage issue as well. Yeah, maybe. But I really like how you've, you would never know that it's an old building that's been expanded to a new, like it's, I think it'd be blended very well. I like the idea of the natural lighting at top. Um, and then after you having the tour through it, I mean, it's gonna be night and day different in size. <laughs> yeah, and some of, the, some of the contractors that we've been including in our discussions, they've already looked and found some brick that they feel matches up pretty well to the existing brick. Um, and you could take a look at the majority of these walls, like this end wall, the majority will stay, we'll open it up a little bit, but these are walls that are existing for the most part that we're able to lay it out and, and maintain the walls that are in there ready to, and utilize those. I think it looks good. I'm, I'm against probably everybody else with the door things because we've made it look so much like the old fashioned building if you look at it, I, I like the older, the older style doors, the ones on top. I do too. Um, instead of the glass doors, but I mean, look at that. That's yeah, with the cupola and everything else, it's it's looking historically kind of like an old building. I'm, that's just that's just my opinion. I like the older, maybe wood style doors. Plus, it's a storage garage, and who knows throwing ramps in and out and all that other stuff. I know tempered glass is tempered glass, but tempered glass can still break if you're, if you're throwing a ramp through it or a bridge or whatever the heck, whatever the else, whatever it else it is they're putting in there. But I, I do think the glass looks pretty too. I just, I just like the old school looking up top. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's some good points to be made for some stronger garage doors there as well. And yeah. maybe we can, um, continue to bring that back for discussion as we finalize the design. Maybe we can come up with an example <laughs> instead of just on a concept, an actual picture of a door that could maybe go on there. So, yeah, I just think you'd want to start your door and, and on all the glass on, on the other places you have 
pull down protection. Yeah, pull down protection over, but then we'd have a whole side of glass garage doors, which is a little different, but without pull down protection. Yeah. Okay. Just for scale, are those Clanamid's regular size garage doors? No, I th want to say they're ten foot high by twelve foot wide. Okay, so they we keep the bay trucks and yeah, uh, we've made sure to keep um, the membership from Otter Street involved, their president and vice president, okay. and those were some of the things they requested was actually going wider. I think it's smart the way you made the posts removable, so in the winter they can just drive right on through. Um, but during the summer, you can keep everybody protected from a car rolling in there. Yep. Um, building, I like the building a lot. I think it looks really, I don't think it looks really nice. I think there's some balance, you know, as we said, we'd like to try to preserve that history, but yeah, we're trying to modernize it a little okay. bit as well. Um, I think that's a nice little ad right next to it. The shade structure here? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. That's a great ad. Yeah. You'll get more people hanging around the beach area when you get that stuff out there. Okay, a good input, and I can bring that back. Um, I think from what I'm hearing, we'll have a little more discussion on the garage doors, maybe come up with some pictures of what could actually be there, um, and maybe some actual pictures of the tempered glass that we're looking at. Okay, thank you. All right. Did you have something? Update on the Menominee Park Pratt Trail road construction. All right, so this was a project that, um, if you recall, we had in our list of CIP projects, um, I believe we had it split out over two years of uh, half million dollars each year as the council was deliberating this year's CIP budget last October November um, they wanted to see that project moved up and get done sooner so they actually allocated funding this year to redo Pratt Trail which is basically um, from Merritt the, the entrance off of Merritt that then goes around the zoo along the water goes all the way up around the amusements over the historic Cooper Wells Bridge and then back to um, Seaward Trail, which is the, the road on the, the west side of the zoo. So we've been working with our engineering staff. They've been short-staffed considerably throughout the year, um, but they have this out for bids right now. Um, we originally had talked about, um, when it went out for bids, allowing the contractor either to do the project this fall or next spring. As we met um, internally, we decided that doing it this spring would be too much of an inconvenience, mainly for celebration of lights and then our um, exciting, day. exciting day at, no, 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 the um, Zulu and Boo. Sorry. Yes. You mean fall, you said spring. I'm sorry. So <laughs> it would have been too much of an inconvenience this fall for celebration of lights and our um, event at the zoo. So what we decided was let's keep it for spring and um, it's weather dependent, but you know they could get in there and potentially start on some utility work because there's some storm sewer work and um, other things underground that have to happen as part of this. So hopefully they can get in sometime in March. And then in the contract itself, we're telling them that the um, substantial completion date needs to be June 9th of next year. So when we looked at it, we had very few shelter rentals in that time. We were able to, Stacy worked with accommodating those. Um, the one event that Chad and Jenny um, continue some discussion on, that is the egg hunt for Easter at the zoo. Um, looking to probably relocate that one for one year um, because that entire road will be closed down for that entire period. Um, in order to, to get it done quicker, that's what we need to do. Otherwise, you're trying to accommodate traffic going in and out, and it just delays the project. So I just wanted to give this board an update and let the public know, because I know it's, it's been a road that people have complained about for quite some time. Um, I think when it's done, you're going to enjoy the design. Wherever there's a pedestrian or a bicycle crossing, um, we're adding tabletops, which are um, smooth, raised. Um, they're not speed bumps, but it's a safe crossing for pedestrians. Basically, it goes up. There's a flat spot for six to eight feet and then it drops back down slowly. So it's a nice pedestrian friendly crossing area. Um, the bridge, uh, the decking on the bridge will be redone, which is very much needed. Um, up between the amusement area and the Kiwanis shelter, we're adding some additional parking. There's a little bit of um, curb where it jots into the road right now. We're gonna cut that back and add some additional parking there as well for events and, and shelter rentals. Anything I'm forgetting, Chad? That 
No, I just think logistically in the time frame to, or how the construction process were that with the Cooper's Wells Bridge being a weight limit, there's a lot of vehicles that go out in construction, so they've actually got to go back to that bridge and work their way back out from that perspective. So you think of timing something, say, oh, man, you can get this section done and wait on this one. Not really how that works in this type of project. So that makes it challenging for other events. So that's where we're at. Uh, the bids for this project, they're due on um, a week from today, actually on the 19th. And um, we'll see how they come in. Um, we'll know how much more or less the, the budget that we have allocated will be required. So Quick any question? Yes. When, when did you get the original bid? How long ago? We don't have an original bid. It's just out for bids now. Ah, okay. Yep. So it's not like you had one before when the price of blacktop or that's what was high, and now you might no. when it's the first opening? The, the closest thing we had was in our Menominee Park master plan. Um, our consultant did some updated pricing for us within the last year to a year and a half, but again, things have changed. Um, so we're, we're hopeful, but um, until then, and we feel that maybe giving the contractors until spring might give us some, some better pricing as well because everybody is very busy now trying to, to get projects buttoned up and also staffing and other things that have come into play. So, That's all I had. All right. Update on Parks Department full-time staffing. I am going to let Chad and Travis kind of talk. They both had this on their reports when they sent it over to Stacy and I, so we just said we'd, we'd put it on here. Um, but I think for the first time in probably three years, Parks and Forestry is fully staffed at this point, um, which is long time cr coming. Um, so if you guys want to kind of talk about your divisions and where you're at, I guess. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, um, so Landscape Operations recently hired um, three ground specialists. Um, so the intent with the three of them, there was actually two ground specialist positions open and my old lead position. So there were three excellent candidates that we thought. So instead of letting go of one, we decided to um, backfill, your backfill my position. And then with the intent that Coming in the next six months, we will internally open my the lead position up. That way we're not actually adding another position. We are simply retaining another good candidate. Um, but yeah, so that, with that, we are full. We'll probably go, awesome. through, go through some more transitions next year. We may have a potential retirement in the Parks Department uh, and the labor end, which will be a little transition. But this year, over the past uh, four months, four or five months, excuse me, we've had uh, three new staff people come in for park maintenance roles. We've also done a shift for an additional zoo specialist position to give us three in the zoo to work with our long-term planning uh, for the rotation and staffing and safe operations of that facility. So things keep moving in a positive direction. So it's it's working out well. But as we tell everybody when they start, you got to see everything through every season because every season's different. So there's a lot of training going on uh, <laughs> and adapting right now. <laughs> so it's going well. Do you have any reads like how that's really good news. Do you increase wages? Did you just promote more heavily? Because it's really nice to hear. But what do you know? Any reason why you feel like we're finally fully staffed? I, I don't know. We didn't raise wages wages at all. Which we just got into a spurt where there's actually a decent flow of candidates coming in. So great. Yeah, we are. The city is currently going through for all positions a comp and classification um, study and update that hasn't come out yet. Um, so it, I think it, it was just a matter of timing because on Travis's positions, we, we weren't even getting applicants for the arborist positions or ground specialists for at least six months. Um, and all of a sudden we had three or four come in and that's where we, we decided if we've got good candidates, we're going to figure out a way to get them on board and, and try to keep them here. So and I think same thing with Chad, all of a sudden you know, we had some, some really good candidates coming through and um, we were able to, to get them on board and hopefully they can enjoy what they're doing for a couple of years. Perfect. All right, on the staff reports. All right, on my reports, I've got an update on the Lakeshore Park Four Seasons building. This project's been delayed. Um, they're still working 
um, but we know that there's some HVAC, some electrical, and some fire, um, I don't want to say fire suppression, but the, the strobes, the exit lights, some of those things um, they're having trouble getting. Um, our original schedule planned for the building to be done sometime this November. Um, that will not be achieved. I'm just waiting to find out a little bit more on um, some of those details. So again, you know, it's, it's material delays, but there's also some other um, issues that we're working on out there, but it's primarily the material delays that, at least in the January, uh, potentially even longer. Um, because as we're working on the next project, our Parks Administration building, um, that one has some material delays. Um, we're not able to get the precast concrete walls until possibly April. So that's why it's been delayed already. They just said, we don't want to start too much now because we can't get the walls up possibly till April or May. Um, so it's really a trickle down effect. And it's, again, if, if you're in any type of business, you're probably seeing the same thing, or if you're purchasing things, you're hearing and seeing it. Um, so the Four Seasons building, still moving along. Um, our Parks Administration Operations building, um, we have actually moved, Stacy and I, um, middle of August, we transitioned over to 3rd third st third Street in Idaho, so a block south of where we were, into the water distribution, and Chad and Travis and the field staff are across the street at the DPW um, building. There's a, a balcony space that was able to accommodate some cubicle space for them, along with some uh, break room and other things for our field staff. So I think for the most part, the transition's going pretty well. Um, as far as the building itself, um, they have, they're removing some of the final pieces before they can start demo. I believe some of the demo may actually begin tomorrow. So I would think within the next two to three weeks, that building you're going to see is going to be removed from the site. And then they will start doing some of the, the earthwork and um, some of the other work that they can get done prior to winter. So um, it's very busy. Um, we've got, as you'll hear from Chad and, and the others as they report, we got a lot of stuff going on. We've got some big projects between Four Seasons, our building, the zoo and fox exhibit at the at the zoo, um, and just operations, emerald ash borer, and special events. Um, so you're going to hear a lot of reports, but uh, it's pretty exciting, I think, for us um, to get these new facilities, um, get our, get all of our staff under one roof. That the, the Parks Administration is going to be huge for us, um, just efficient, not only for office staff and administrative staff, but our field staff been able to get in and park vehicles in a, a designated location and not stacking them, wondering if there's going to be snow or rain if we have to get certain pieces of equipment out. So stay tuned for that one. Um, update on the Chief Oshkosh sign project. If you recall, this was approved um, a while back, earlier, late last winter, early spring. Um, we actually uh, went out for quotes on the signs and we issued an order um, for the signs back in March. Um, at that time, we were told it was about, gonna be about 14 to 16 weeks, so we were expecting somewhere in August, September. Um, we continually check on it. I actually called an email today to try to get another update. Um, same thing, they are very short staff. They said coming out of the pandemic, people were holding off on ordering a lot of their signs, and so they told me um, they've never seen this many orders for signs in their history, so they're trying to ramp up with staff to try to keep up. Um, I called today, did not get a response back. I'm trying to look here, I made a note. I got an email from them on uh, August 24th. She said, just check back in four to six weeks and I should be able to give you an update. Um, so that's all I have for now. It's, it's been delayed. It's again, something um, I think primarily staffing wise. And so we'll continue to stay on top of that one. Problem with it being so delayed is um, if we don't get them in time to get the concrete walkway and the concrete pads around the, the area, it's probably a project that might have to wait until spring when we can get in there as well. So it really depends on, on you know, when or if we get them here in the next month or two potentially. So any questions on any of those? All right, I'm done talking. All right, Chad, you're up. <laughs> Yeah, just the one update I want to provide you as regards to the Bear Fox exhibit for Menominee Park Zoo. Uh, similar to how Ray said, we know there's some delays and things going forward. In early August, we met with a contractor in regards to developing a construction plan going into fall, see how well it worked, and in a, everything worked out perfectly. We were able to hopefully get our foundation and footings in the grounds to work from, from the base of the building. Um, we've come into some more challenges utility-wise and our plan-wise to what we're trying to work out uh, from a private and public end. Uh, so our focus is right now is to get all the utilities dealt with 
uh, squared away so when all materials do show up throughout the course of the year they can start in spring and have everything here to work with our timelines for stuff on our docket are on scheduled right now with our submittals which is good so let's just hope things come in well and they're ready to go so we can keep moving uh, when it's time to put CMU uh, you know, CMU walls up and all that stuff and, and start moving with that. Um, over the course of the winter, I'm going to stay in contact with our wildlife agencies that I've been in communication with to date uh, to make sure with the time frames and what we're looking for for black bears uh, coming in. And obviously we have the two fox on hand in our zoo already that will be relocated to that exhibit when it's constructed. So it'll be a nice transition come spring and summer. Hopefully we'll get things going and um, have some good uh, weather so we can develop the landscape around there so neither of the species are going into a bare bones exhibit uh, where it's more developed uh, for their, the, the quality of their life. So uh, be patient, but it's coming. So looking Where's forward to that one as well. Um, if you drive down uh, past the community playground, on the left-hand side, you'll see some construction fence set up inside. Uh, we will be putting up um, uh, barriers on the fences as well with a construction plan or a concept so people know what is coming on site there. So okay. that's taking place. So. so it's between Pratt Trail and the Eagle exhibit, basically. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have today. Thank you. Thank you. Travis? Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Eichen Acres project of North Conservancy. There was, I think, 13 properties along the north property line that um, there was, what, 130 ash right on that property line that were, a lot of them were leaning towards it, and um, it's just possibly a bad situation for the homeowners. And so we went in and we got... I want to say at least 110 of them gone um, throughout the past couple of weeks. Um, so th that top property line looks a lot different. It's not necessarily Air. clear cut, but it's, well, it's, we, we left all the non ash. So there's still some um, box elder. There's a couple of elms and some other more desirable species back there. But um, the weather held up for us and we were able to get in and pretty much clean it up and at least get another section of the conservancy um, cleared out of the ash so it's, it's still a lot there though you want to talk a little bit about the whole ash problem throughout the city and what you're working on yeah um so there's i want to say probably upwards of 700 terrace ash trees um, blast at the beginning of this year um, last or late last winter, um, the city actually, or the council approved uh, for a contract to come through the southwestern area, part of the city, and take down the majority of the ash trees, which they've started and um, have until uh, November to complete. They have since, in what was that, July, I believe, they um, approved another contract for the north and the east part of the city to finish off um, the majority of the ash trees. With that, they have until December 31st of this year to clean up the rest of the roughly 350-ish trees. Um, what's nice with that second contract is they will also be taking the stumps. Um, with the first contract, the city is are responsible for the stumps and the restoration. So um, we will get to your stumps. That just might take a little bit. <laughs> just um, get to my trees. That's right. So um, with that, there's probably another, I want to say close to 700 plus ash trees with throughout the park system. Um, and just in green spaces. So. We are getting there with those. Most of those will be taken care of in the winter months or, you know, in the dead of summer when it's, you know, the uh, turf is hard enough that we can get machines in. But. Uh, I, it's just a devastation. I don't know if you've driven around the city and, and seen some of the, um, the streets. Um, one of them is right off of Witzel. If you take Lark Street but, to the north. 
drive through there, you're going to see a number of them have been removed. But then as you get to the further end, north end of Lark, you're going to see both sides of the streets with dead ash trees. Um, there's another down on the um, south side. Yep, there's, there's quite a few. Um, I don't know if any of you have driven down Maricopa um, oh. in the past few years. Uh, Maricopa, between 9th Ave and uh, West Haven Drive, was nothing but ash. Nice, beautiful, you know, 36 inch diameter ash trees, and they are all completely gone. There's not one ash tree left on that street. And so it's, we have since gone and replanted, um, and it's our plan to go through and help replant. Um, we are starting a, it's a, a fundraising campaign to help raise some funds for replanting the ash trees. But, uh, and it's, I, I guess another street that um, you could go and look at if you really want to see is Viola over by um, Quick Trip on Jackson Street. If you go down right off between Wisconsin and Beach, I think it is. Another street that's just lined with, you know, 24 to 36 inch DBH ash, where it's just like the old time where the crowns come up and actually mm -hmm. almost encompass the street. And they're all going to be have to, all going to have to be taken down within the next year. Or well, actually, those are all on the list, so they'll be down by December 31st. So, yes. So the Wisconsin DNR does not have any program to help the city with tree replanting for at least buying the nursery stock. We're looking into. I know there's the regular urban forestry grant which we apply for. Aside from that, I'm not sure that they, I think that there's just too many municipalities with too big of a problem throughout the state. What do you do with the wood? Like, do you guys sell the wood then? Or like, can't you make profit? Uh, right now we money house it on city property. We just haul it. And um, eventually, um, last year when we took 240 ash trees down in house, um, we hauled it to a, a city lot and we had a contractor come in and grind everything. And they hauled it and turned it into chips. So. Okay, back to your question. We are going to be applying for a urban forestry grant through the DNR to try to get some replacement dollars. Um, we're not sure how successful it is be as like Travis said, every community just about is dealing with this issue. So, um, but it is something that that um, Ann Schaefer, who's our marketing and fund development coordinator, she's working on right now, actually. And then Travis alluded to a little bit, but um, when the council back in July approved hiring another contractor for the removals, we requested um, it's about ninety-six or ninety-eight thousand dollars additional uh, for, for us to be able to start replanting. Um, what we're doing is working with the Oshkosh Area Community Foundation. That money is going into. We have a taking root fund over there. That money is going over to the community foundation, and you're going to probably hear something in the next couple of weeks from the foundation. Um, they're helping us to get a, a public-private partnership going on, um, a campaign to get that done. So um, we're working closely with them to try to raise about uh, about a half million dollars to replace the trees that we're taking down. So Minnesota DNR had a, had a thing where you could um, you could get free trees, but they had you had to establish. Parks departments had to establish gravel beds, and then community members had to do the planting with the supervision of staff. That's not always ideal, I understand, and I was kind of doubtful about it, but it, some places worked better than others, but I didn't know if there was a corollary program like that here. Yeah, like I said, we're, um, we're hopeful that the DNR is going to fund some replacement for us, so we'll see. see. Any phone numbers you'd like to distribute for us to do some <laughs> <laughs> We might be able to get a letter of support from this board, of course. So. <laughs> yep. Jenny. Okay. Um, so you'll see kind of a list of here of our upcoming events. So on October 24th here, we have our Touch Our Truck event down at the Leach Amphitheater. September um, 24th. Or yeah, September. I'm gonna go September 24th. Um, so not this weekend, but next weekend. Um, that's a big community event sponsored by Ashkosh Corporation. Um, we have all kinds of trucks that come in, different businesses um, that bring their trucks in. Some of are just private, you know, businesses. Some are bigger businesses, but the kids get to climb on and take pictures and 
um, explore the trucks. We also have a, a ride-on area where the kids can drive around the remote control trucks. Um, we have a, a remote control kind of the smaller cars for the older kids that they buzz around. Um, an interactive area, so lots going on. It's a it's a great event. We typically get between 2,000 2,500 people that wow. day. Um, so we are definitely in the need of volunteers for that event. For some reason, we are we are lacking um, our volunteers right now. So if you know of any group you're associated with, or if your kiddos have any volunteering to do for school or um, anything that you could think of, um, if you could reach out to me, that would be great. We definitely um, are going to need more help for that event coming very soon here. Um, and what do you have to do? Just chaperone so kind of thing? We have kind of people um, up at the top of the leech. We have four bounce houses up there, and we have to have a person at each bounce house for the kids to be able to go in and use them. The next tier down, we have a big row of games. There's five to six games, so we need volunteers to run those games. Um, typically, we do like to have a volunteer at each gate just welcoming people with a donation um, bin out there, and we do get a, a good fair amount of donations at the gate. Um, and also just handing out, for instance, for this, we'd be handing out information about October 14th and 15th to people that come in. So it's a great way to promote things too. Um, so yeah, just kind of over, you know, doing games and overseeing the different ride on areas, remote control areas. So it's, it's one of our biggest ones. So it's, it takes a lot of hands to make it work. So, um, then October 15th is our bruise at the zoo. That is new 14. this year. <laughs> Can't. October 14th, I'm sorry. <laughs> apparently I need to go home on this Monday. Um, October 14th is Brews at the Zoo. So this is our first annual event. It's like an adult um, costume contest party. And we're going to have bands, food trucks, uh, craft beers. So it's kind of an extension off of our Brews on the Bay that we're doing in the zoo that evening. Um, of course, families are welcome. Kids are welcome. But it's more geared towards a night event for that one. Um, and then the following day, we have our Zulueen Boo with this year's actually our 20th annual, um, which is kind of crazy that that event has been going for that long. But um, that's always a great event that we always need a lot of volunteers for as well. Um, the area businesses and organizations set up trick-or-treat stations, so we typically get between 35 and 40 of those booths the kids go around and trick-or-treat from station to station. Um, and then we have... 12 games that we look for volunteers to run the games and we hand out candy for those. Um, we also have an event tent full of different entertainers all day throughout the day and food trucks for that as well. So lots of fun coming up in September and October. Um, as far as news at the zoo, it was supposed to be this past weekend, which we made the best call ever to cancel that event. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's always so hard to, you know, when you put so much time and effort into an event and, and everyone's excited about it, it's really, really hard to cancel them. Um, and we kind of went back and forth, back and forth, like, is the weather going to be right or is it not going to be right? Because if they're right, it's going to be miserable, you know, and yeah. the, the percentage as the week went on just kept on going higher and higher. Um, so we unfortunately had to cancel that one um, due to the, to the weather this um, weekend. So um, Wildlife Wednesday programs and programs at the zoo. In about the middle of the summer, um, we had a uh, new person take over the zoo education coordinator position. Um, so we kind of had a little bit of a transition in the summer, but the programs have been great. Um, so every day the zoo education coordinator offers two to three programs a day. They can be anything like uh, scavenger hunts, or they could do a demonstration with say our blue macaw that's at the zoo. They could bring the skunks out and do a program. So they do about two to three things a day. Um, so in June, we had 1,522 people attend those programs. In July, we had 1,940. Um, August, 744 for a total for the summer of 4,206 people that attended those daily programs, which is really awesome um, for our little zoo. So, And then we also have what we call Wildlife Wednesdays. Those events are, we bring in people from the outside. So we had like a program for June Dairy Month. Um, we also had a turtle presenter come in, monarchs. It's different people we bring in. Um, every Wednesday we do it from the first week in June until the last um, Wednesday in August. And so for those throughout the summer, um, we had 793 people participate in those as well. So um, really great summer, you know, at the zoo and our, our zoo education coordinator that took over, um, you know, kind of transitioned really quickly and has just done a really great job continuing that throughout the summer. So 
Um, and lots of families really enjoy coming down with the kiddos um, to, to participate in those. So that has been really good. Our Brews on the Bay events, uh, we had eight of them scheduled this summer to on Wednesday night. That will be our last one. So September 14th um, will be our last um, Brews on the Bay. And those have been phenomenal. We've had um, bands and food trucks and family yard games, just people coming down with, you know, biking down or walking down, um, kind of kids all over, families all over, just visiting. So they've been really, really well attended. Um, we, the only one we had to cancel was the very first one of the season. So other than that, we had beautiful weather and um, it's looking good for Wednesday night too. This is going to pass us for our last <laughs> one. So uh, it's been a great year for those. Um, and a lot of people who didn't attend them last year, they didn't know about them. So they, you know, were excited about them this year and, and looking forward to coming in the future years. Um, so as far as facilities, things are starting to, to close down here. Um, or have closed down. So August 19th was the last day at the pool. Um, the last day at the amusement center was on September 5th on Labor Day. Um, our ball diamonds wrapped up that last week of um, August and we are still open at the Lake Fly Cafe and the zoo until the last Sunday in, uh, in September. Um, so we got a couple more weekends. The zoo is open every day still um, from 9 until 6 p.m. and the Lake Fly Cafe is open Saturday and Sundays throughout September. So still have some things going on and kind of gearing into these last um, events of the year. So um, probably during the November, December meeting, I'll be able to put a document together kind of with all the numbers for all the events and um, how many people we had at our Tuesday night concert series this year and our brews on the bay. Um, it's all in a big stack right now, just waiting to finish up the events and then we'll get to putting that all into some forms to share with you guys how things went for the season. So any questions about any of that? All right. All right. Anything else? All right. Motion. <laughs> Motion by Tony, second by Millette. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you everyone, have a good evening. You too.